the Arabic language, a lecture given on December 3rd, 1868, by Thomas Cheenery, part two, recording by Abu Jalal. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Abu Jalal. Assuming then that the student desires to obtain a real knowledge of the classical Arabic, and with that purpose has the courage to investigate the principles of its structure in the works of the native grammarians, it remains to direct his attention to the literature which will be opened to him as the reward of his perseverance. Here, indeed, his researches must be determined by the bent of his own mind or the purposes to which he may intend to apply his knowledge. He may desire to study the Muslim law for its practical usefulness in the East. He may be curious concerning the influence of the Arabian philosophy and science on Christendom during the Middle Ages. He may be an investigator of history and wish to draw the materials for a knowledge of the relations of Western Asia with Europe from sources not generally sought. To give a sketch of the voluminous literature of the Arabian writers in a single lecture would be impossible, even if I had the learning for the task. Philosophy, mathematics, astronomy, chemistry, medicine were taken by our forefathers from the Arabian schools. The Aristotle, which was taught in the universities four centuries since, was not the Greek text of that philosopher, but a compilation founded on the commentary of Averroes. The names of the stars, of chemical instruments or substances, even the word algebra and the use of the decimal notation bear witness to the activity of the Arabian teachers and their influence on the Christian nations. The names of Avicenna, Aben Pace, Razis, and many others are widely known as those of the most successful seekers after knowledge at a time when darkness overspread the Latin and Teutonic nations. And it is recorded that even a pope, the learned Gerbert, afterwards Sylvester II, studied in the Moorish schools of Spain. But this learning has been long superseded by the larger teachings of modern science. Those works of the intellect which need chiefly the more sober faculties of man, judgment, penetration, industry, perseverance, are destined to neglect. The reward of their authors is to bear an honoured name among those who have advanced the knowledge and happiness of mankind. But the productions themselves live only as undistinguishable elements in the compositions of those who come after, and to enlarge and transform the sphere of science. A similar fate awaits the labours of those who are learned in an unprofitable learning, the scholastics and metaphysicians, who, neglecting the phenomena of nature and the events of life, construct systems on the processes of their own minds, or of some text whose absolute authority they take for granted. The literature of the Kalam, or scholastic theology of the Muslims, fills innumerable volumes, and some acquaintance with it is necessary for a due comprehension of their history. The more practical commentaries on the Quran and the treatises on law, which with them is founded on the sacred text, may be read with profit by the advanced student. But in all these he must expect to find much that is at once wearisome and frivolous and that gives no due reward to his labours. The works of real genius, however, are ever fresh and young, 
and their light structure floats on the stream of time when the ponderous barks freighted with the accumulations of the learned are one by one engulfed after the arabian mind has been exercised by centuries of authorship a professor of the language is compelled to declare that the works in which an european student will find most pleasure are the poems of the unlettered arabs of the ignorance that is of the period which preceded the advent of muhammad these which though individually short make up in their entirety a considerable mass should be read with care by whoever desires to understand the primitive spirit of the people here there is nothing artificial nothing of that tasteless and puerile extravagance which we associate with oriental composition the primitive arab like the hebrew had a chaste and classic genius there is nothing monstrous and elephantine in his conceptions nor on the other hand is he infected with the odious taste for artifices and conceits which distinguishes the authors of a later age the most simple and primitive form of poetical diction is what is called sedja or cadence that is a rhymed prose consisting of short unmetrical sentences having the same dissonance the versicles which have been handed down as the utterances of soothsayers and wizards are generally in this style in the legend of the breaking of the dyke of marib in yemen the event which led to the great dispersion of the southern tribes the sorceress zarifa is made to speak in rhymed prose when the two deformed soothsayers shiq and setah interpret the dream of rabi'at ibn nasr and predict the birth of the prophet they use the same primeval speech and it is often placed by the chroniclers in the mouths of the women of the tribes while the men are made to declaim in metrical verse but as has been said the regular qasida of the arabs with its perfect prosody is found already in existence more than a century before the preaching of muhammad the first who composed a regular poem is said to have been adi called muhalhil who thus lamented the murder of his brother kuleib the chief of the tribe of rabi'a and the most powerful prince in arabia this event took place probably in the last ten years of the fifth century after christ before that time poetry had only been declaimed by each man according to his needs in other words it consisted of a few lines improvised on occasion and addressed to the tribe in council to the enemy on the battlefield to the shade of a slain friend to the judge who had to decide some question of honor or precedence to the mistress who had been carried away by her family or had preferred a rival the passion for poetry seized the most cultivated tribes and there was scarcely a chief or a hero who did not declaim upon occasion the most celebrated name among the poets of the ignorance is that of imrul qais the kindi who is believed to have visited constantinople in the early years of justinian it was probably he who gave the qasida the form which it retained for centuries in the verses of this type the poet is supposed to arrive with two friends on the site of a deserted encampment and to lament the disappearance of his mistress who has been carried off by her tribe he then passes to his feats in love or war describes the noble form and high spirit of his horse the fleet pace of his camel his sharp and glittering sword his perils and his sufferings nothing can exceed the vigor of each description 
the fiery soul of the poet glows through his declamations and the free life of the desert is depicted for us with a few marvellous touches such were the poems recited at the yearly fair of okerv near mecca on the territory and under the presidency of the quraysh who although they were not distinguished in poetry themselves held as the guardians of the kaaba the highest position among the arab tribes several of these poems bear the title of muallaqat or the suspended and common tradition derives the name from their having been suspended in the holy house by reason of their surpassing excellence the seven which are commonly received as muallaqat have been edited in germany by f r arnold and are easily accessible the first muallaqa is that of imrul qais of whom mention has been made the second is that of torafa a youthful and profligate poet who was murdered when only twenty years old the subject is the loss of a herd of camels belonging to himself and his brother which was carried off while torafa was passing his time in pleasure another was declaimed by al harith the son of hillize before amr son of hind the king of hira some men of the tribe of taghlib having been wilfully led astray by the men of bekr so that they perished of thirst in the desert the men of taghlib claimed the price of blood the matter was referred to king amr and each side sent an orator the orator of bekr provoked the king so that the king would not hear him and the matter was about to be decided against the tribe when harith stepped forward and began to declaim he was so leprous that his people covered him with a veil that he might not offend the sight of the king leaning on a bow which pierced through his hand without his perceiving it in his poetic fury he improvised the defence of bek as he proceeded the king was so charmed that he bade him lift the veil and when he had ended amr placed him by his side on the royal seat some say that the muallaqa of amr son of kulthum was declaimed on the opposite part at this contest it is a fiery and exulting panegyric of his own tribe of taghlib and worthy of the warrior who afterwards struck the king dead for a trifling insult and gave rise to the proverb as swift to slay as amr ibn kulthum i will mention only one more muallaqa that of antara or antar son of shaddad the chief hero of arabian romance he was not of pure arab blood his mother having been an abyssinian slave so that he was one of the aghriba or crows of the arabs that is a warrior of dark skin of whom several were famous nor was he handsome for his mouth was deformed and he was known by the name of antara of the split lip but he performed prodigies of valor and his adventures have been made the subject of the most voluminous of eastern romances portions of which are still recited by persons who are called anatira or recounters of the adventures of antar this muallaqa was inspired by his love for his cousin abla whose family were unwilling that she should marry the son of a slave and who in consequence imposed on antara the most perilous adventures from these slight indications the nature of the early arabic poetry will be sufficiently understood not only did chiefs and warriors compose but there was a class of vagabonds outcasts and robbers gifted with poetic genius whose verses have come down to us foremost among these desert devils as they were called was shanfara the author of the lamiyatul arab that is a poem of which the rhyme is the letter l he was a vagabond of the tribe of azd and lived in the utmost misery and squalor he celebrates his filth 
his tattered garb, his matted and vermin-infested hair, with the same exulting energy with which he tells of his speed of foot and the perils of his wild life. He vowed to kill one hundred of the Banu Salaman. Whenever he met one of them, he exclaimed, To thine eye! And he shot his arrow with such skill that he always pierced the eye of his foeman. Thus he slew ninety-nine, but at last, Asid ibn Jabr, one of the hostile tribe, and himself a famous runner, together with his brother's son, Khazim the Nukmi, lay in wait for him. His enemies tortured and killed him. But some time after, one of them, seeing the mouldering body, gave the head a kick, and a piece of the skull breaking off, fixed in his foot, of which wound he died. Thus, after death, did Shanfara kill his hundredth enemy. To Abbaqa, Shirran was another of this race, and some verses which are attributed to him tell of his wanderings in the desert and of his meetings with the dreaded Ghul, the demon of the wilderness. After Islam, the fine poetic spirit of the Arabs passes away. The Prophet himself had no love for the poets, many of whom reviled him, and his highest praise of the gifted Imrul Qais was that he would lead the band of the poets to hell. Yet he knew well the power of poetry among the tribes, and rewarded the poets of his party, whose victories over the unbelieving declaimers were often the case of numerous conversions. The chief of these laureates of Islam was Hassan ibn Thabit, who was looked upon as the greatest city-born poet of his age. The Arabs believed the natives of towns to have less of the poetic spirit than the desert-born, and there is certainly less of life and vigour in their conceptions. Yet Hassan vanquished the sons of Tamim in a mufakhara, or strife of honour, having praised the Prophet and his followers with more splendid eloquence than was displayed by Utarib, son of Hajib, and Zibrikan, son of Badr, the poets of Tamim. Another of the Muslim poets was Ka'b ibn Zuhair, whose poem called the Burda, or Mantle, is still extant. He recited his Qasida in the mosque before the Prophet, and when he came to the words, Truly the Prophet is as a sword drawn by God, Muhammad, delighted, cast his mantle upon him. This mantle was afterwards bought by the Khalif, Muawiyah, for 20,000 dirhams, and was worn by his successors on the two great feast days of the year. It is said to be the same which is yearly exhibited to the faithful at Constantinople. After the generation which listened to these poets had passed away, a great change came over the mind of the Arabs. The Quran itself seemed to foreshadow it. The earlier surahs, composed at Mecca while Muhammad's zeal was new and made more fierce by persecution, are sublime and vivid and show a high order of lyric genius. They are not in verse, but in rhymed periods of the nature of the Seja, of which I have spoken. But when the enthusiast of Mecca is changed into the prince of Medina, the spirit of the composition is sensibly lowered. The style is more flat and prolix. The celestial voice is employed on wearisome invective. The revelation concerns itself with petty details. The motives suggested are less lofty and the argument is trivial and barren. The influence of an infallible book, and of a religion of rigid and never-ceasing observance, still more, the direction of the energy of the race to foreign conquest, were unfavourable to the free poetical spirit of the Arabs. Within the space of a lifetime, the character of the composition was completely changed, and before the first century of the Hijra had closed, the poet Farazdaq had introduced antithesis and conceits into poetry, and the first germs of corruption 
were implanted in the tastes of the people. The language, too, is recognized as less pure, and this theory of the degeneracy of their speech is carried so far by the learned Arabs that they will not admit anyone to be an absolute authority on the use of words or on grammatical mechanism except a jahili or poet of the ignorance, that is, one who died before the preaching of Islam, or else a muhadram, that is, one who was contemporary with it. An Islami, that is, a poet of the first three or four centuries of Islam, is of less consideration, and after this age, the poets are called modern and have no linguistic authority. Yet, poets of great genius arose in successive ages. The highest place in Arabic literature is given by some to Abu Taib Ahmed, known as al mutanabbi that is, the pretender to prophecy, who flourished in the 10th century of our era. His natural genius was of the highest order, and if he had lived in an earlier age, his poetry would have rivaled the Mu'allaqat in noble simplicity. But his lot fell upon a time when the worst vices that can affect composition had invaded the Arabic style. The bent of his mind may be judged from the incident to which he owes his surname. In early manhood, he went forth into the Syrian desert about Palmyra and erected the standard of a prophet, declaiming to the wild tribes among whom he made many converts. He was defeated and taken prisoner, but in the year 949 he repaired to the court of Saifuddola at Aleppo and sang the praises of that prince. It is singular to find a poet full of the genius of battle, wild and gloomy by natural temperament, studying his grandly conceived compositions with miserable conceits, and deliberately descending to the level of the worst versifiers of a court. Another name which I must mention is that of Ibn al farad the mystic poet of Cairo, and the most celebrated Arabic writer of the school of the Sufis. This order or sect of Muslims, so called from the robe of wool, Suf, worn by the first ascetics who belonged to it, has exercised the most powerful and enduring influence on the Arabic and Persian literatures. Ibn al farid devoted himself to religion and seldom quitted the mosque of Al-Azhar in Cairo though tempted by an offer of the post of chief qadi of Egypt. He fell into trances which lasted days together, and while in this state he neither heard nor saw what passed around him. Yet, if we are to credit his biographers, it was when entranced that he composed his loftiest poetry. The verses thus inspired are of that strange order which clothes heavenly conceptions with the grossest material forms, which allegorizes the inflow of the divine spirit under the name of wine, and makes sensual love typify the mystical union of the soul with God. Ibn al farid was born in the year 1181 of our era, and died in 1234. He is held in high estimation in the East, where he is placed in the same class as his contemporary, the Persian poet Jalaluddin Rumi, the author of the Masnavi, the greatest and most original work of the Sufi school. It remains that I should treat of a subject not less important than any that has been mentioned, namely the influence of Arabic on the other languages of the Muslim world. It is from this influence, or rather supremacy, that an advocate of the study of Arabic derives some of his strongest arguments. The power of the Mohammedan religion is so direct and absolute over its votaries and so affects every act and relation of life that the idiom of the Quran must always be a second language for the followers of the Prophet. To this religious preeminence, political and social preeminence, were added for several generations after the preaching of Islam. And the tongues of the various nations 
subjected to the khalifs were exposed to the irresistible and ceaseless action of a language which represented at once celestial and earthly dominion some languages have entirely disappeared or remained only as the inheritance of remote and secluded tribes and the arabic has taken their place in africa it has vanquished every rival speech from the red sea to the atlantic ocean in asia the syrians were a cultivated and quick-witted people when the arab conqueror imposed his yoke they bowed in submission but not in despair they soon began to exercise the influence which their higher civilization gave them over their simple masters they were the scribes and accountants of the early governors and it is well known that the first knowledge the muslims obtained of greek letters was from translations made into arabic by syrian writers often from existing syriac translations add to this that damascus was the first seat of the caliphate that syria at the time of the arab conquest was densely populated full of magnificent and wealthy cities and it would seem that the syrians were in the best position for maintaining and even propagating their own variety of the semitic speech yet the arabic gradually prevailed the literary industry of the syrians did not prevent them from falling under the intellectual influence of the muslims and though we find them at first the masters they appear in a later age as the pupils of the arab men of letters even a work so peculiar as the assemblies of hariri was imitated in syriac as it was also in hebrew for jewish readers who were affected by a similar influence at last the voluminous syriac literature comes to an end with the chronicle of bar hebraeus the arabic language everywhere prevails and at the present day all aramaic speech has passed away except among some obscure christian communities it was possible that the persian nationality and speech might have been thus destroyed but iran had a genius of its own a strong individuality and the traditions of two periods of glory under the achaemenian and sassanian kings the persian has ever maintained some mental independence the effects of which are to be seen in his divergence from the orthodox standard of islam and in a literature which in some respects shows more genius and fancy than that of the arabs the persian language though philologically degenerate and with a simplicity of structure which verges on feebleness resisted long the invasion of the arabic the learned men of persia were among the most devoted students of arabic and in the long list of writers in this language they appear more frequently than any other foreigners but the people and those who composed on popular themes for a long time kept their language unadulterated the persian genius overwhelmed by the first conquests of the arabs revived with the decline of the caliphate and the virtual independence of the country under native princes of the houses of safar samaun boway until a real persian literature arose in the eastern provinces under the celebrated mahmud of ghazna this literature displays a strong national spirit thus when we open the great epic of ferdosi we find the pure speech of the persians with but the very smallest admixture of arabic words even of those which appear it is probable that many had been naturalized in the persian language at an early time and not imposed by the conquests of islam it may be that the theme and the prepossessions of ferdosi made him studious of purity and that he felt the old speech of his race to be the fittest to chronicle the wars of iran and turan the grandeur of feridun and kehosro and the heroic valor of rostam but in the early writers generally there is a comparative rarity of arabic words and phrases in course of time however the influence became too powerful to be resisted the persian language remained and flourished 
but it was completely transformed. Every writer thought himself at liberty not only to introduce Arabic words on occasion, but to mingle in his composition entire phrases from the venerated language. In fact, you may have a Persian sentence in which every important word is Arabic, nothing remaining of the original language but the grammatical structure, the setting, as it were, of the vocables. The most esteemed poets introduce Arabic verses into their pieces, looking on them as the highest ornament of style. The works of Sa'di cannot possibly be understood by one who is ignorant of Arabic. The great Sufi poets Farid al-Din At-Tar and Jalaluddin Rumi make free use of Arabic, which in fact furnishes nearly all the technical terms of Sufism. The odes of Hafez are full of Arabic. Historical writing has not been less affected, and the ordinary language of life has fallen under the same influence. Hence it comes to pass that the knowledge of the modern literary Persian presupposes a knowledge of Arabic. The Persian authors wrote or recited for those who were perfectly acquainted with the tongue of the Quran, and the European who would understand them must perfect himself in the same study. He who attempts to learn the Persian as an independent language will never have more than a misty conception of it, however patiently he may labour, not only words and sentences, but forms of composition, rhetoric, prosody, terms of theology, philosophy, science and art, and even the customary pious phrases of ordinary life are taken from the Arabic. To the proficient in Arabic, the modern Persian is the simplest and easiest of subjects and the application of a very few months gives him a sufficient mastery over it. But an original study of the language is vain, except for the merest vernacular use. Not less has been the influence of the Arabic on the language of the Turks. The cultivated dialect which is spoken and written at Constantinople, and which is known as the Osmanli, is a composite of three different languages, representing, singularly enough, three of the great races into which modern ethnologists have divided mankind. The original stock is the Turkish, a Turanian speech of great vigour and power, as well as of remarkable euphony, and constructed on a system which excites the admiration of all philologers. But in cultivated conversation and writing, this is overlaid by masses of Persian and Arabic, the latter being almost exclusively employed when any grave or lofty subject demands a learned vocabulary. The Turks had not the genius to develop their own remarkable language. They first incorporated the cultivated Persian with its large admixture of Arabic into their speech, and then they Arabicized still further for themselves. The Hindustani, which seems to be called to high destinies in Asia, is a language of the same class, an Indian grammar being associated with a vocabulary which borrows largely from the Arabic and Persian. In all these cases, it is remarkable that the grammatical structure of the original speech maintains itself, as if this formed the true and essential individuality of the language. The adoption of the Arabic alphabet by the nations which have come under the influence of Islam is a subject also worthy of notice. To the languages themselves, it has been certainly a misfortune. The Arabic alphabet is exquisitely suited to its own language, the properties of which it defines with the utmost accuracy. Thus the sounds which the other Semites confused or at least expressed by a single character, are in Arabic clearly discriminated, as he and kha, ain and rain, swad and bad. The orthographical system also, though undoubtedly defective, is not unsuited to the genius of the language, with its clearly defined root and its forms of strict regularity. 
Thus, in Hebrew or Arabic, when we see a word, we commonly know what vowels to supply, because the consonants themselves indicate its form. We can perceive how the Arab and the Jewish grammarians failed even to form a conception of a vowel in our sense of the word, and treated a vocal sound as a consonant affected merely with a certain intonation or motion, heroke. But when an exclusively consonantal writing is applied to languages which have no such regularity, and in which a word cannot be expressed as if it were a formula, endless ambiguity and progressive corruption of the true original sounds of the language are the results. What would have been the fate of the Greek language if the Greeks, on adopting the Phoenician alphabet, had written with consonants only? Happily they did otherwise, and we find that, though the Greek alphabet is identical with the Hebrew, yet the aspirates and gutturals of the Hebrew are used as vowels in the Greek. Just as a modern Jew writing German in the Hebrew character uses the alif for a and the ayin for e. But the Muslim nations were hindered from doing this, chiefly no doubt by the circumstance that they took large numbers of Arabic words bodily into their languages, and the orthography of the imported element imposed itself on the rest. Hence the extreme uncertainty which the learner feels as to the correct pronunciation of the languages which use the Arabic alphabet, and the necessity that the true sound of multitudes of words should be heard from a master or indicated in the lexicon by European letters. The spread of the Arabic alphabet under such unfavorable conditions is a proof of the extraordinary religious and literary influence of the language. To this influence there appears no reason to suppose that a term has yet been set. Among the semi-civilized and the barbarous races of mankind, in Central Asia, in the Malay region, in the vast depths of Africa, the religion of Muhammad, and with it the linguistic primacy of the Arabic language, is everywhere spreading, and the Quran is accepted where the exertions of numbers of devoted missionaries fail to introduce the gospel. The simple monotheistic faith of Islam attracts strongly the minds which have begun to revolt against idolatry. The institutions and the spirit of the religion are also efficient for conversion, since they set a rigid distinction, political and social, as well as theological, between the faithful and the unbeliever, and promise to him who enters Islam predominance in this world as well as happiness in the next. Whatever may be our policy in this matter, the fact that the Muslim propaganda is still as active and successful as when Marachi labored on his refutation of the Quran is a reason why an English university should not neglect the study of the Arabic language. Arabic is not only spoken as a mother tongue over vast regions, but it is the sacred language of 90 million of the human race, extended across the old world from Senegal to the Pacific, from Siberia to the Cape of Good Hope, and what is more extraordinary, there are to be found among all Muhammadan populations men who can write it with sufficient purity. A letter from some spot within the limits of the Chinese Empire will be as good Arabic as a letter written at Damascus or at Mecca, since like Latin in the Middle Ages, the Arabic is a universal language for a great society which feels its unity under all varieties of geographical position or vernacular speech. When to this quality of universality we add its remarkable unchangeableness, there appears sufficient to justify the curiosity and perseverance of the student.
on the future of the language among the races of the shores of the Mediterranean, I am not inclined to speculate. The Arabic of our time is growing by the introduction of new ideas, the consequence of the great impulse of European thought and activity. How far any essential change will be produced is still, I think, uncertain. It may be that, in spite of the efforts of purists, a multitude of words of European origin will invade the old tongue, which will then have to show its plastic power, if it retains it, by triliteralizing or quadriliteralizing them, and subjecting them to the normal methods of Semitic speech. There is every reason to hope that it will accomplish this. As yet it preserves its strong individuality, not only in words but in forms of expression, and has been hardly affected at all by European idiom. If we compare it with the modern Greek, which in its new growth is subject to similar influences, we perceive a marked difference. The Hellene is proud, indeed boastful, of the revived purity of his language, and the elimination of Turkish or Italian words, the place of which has been supplied from the ancient lexicon, or by composites, more or less ingenious. But at the same time, he slavishly follows French idiom and arranges his classic vocables into a bold translation of the language of his neighbours. He will point out to you that there are no impurities in a passage without feeling that the whole passage is itself an impurity. The educated Arab, on the other hand, not only keeps his words but his idioms. He does not write anything analogous to Echo tin timin, I have the honor, or Lambano tin elefterian, I take the liberty. When he wishes to say that a man was hated, he does not use any such phrase as Enepnefse tin vatitatin apostrophin. His higher literary efforts are all in the old classic form. The Greek has lost the old pronunciation of his language, accent having destroyed quantity, as in music the accented notes in the performances of the unskillful tend to trench upon and shorten the others. Modern Greek poetry consists only of rhymed couplets of the stichos politikos, or of other meters still more ignoble and trivial. But if a man of Arab speech composes a poem, it is strictly on the old models. The return of the Egyptian viceroy's troops from Crete is celebrated in rhymed prose after the tradition of the primeval desert. And if a prince of Wales or a Turkish grandee is to be honoured, the poet's complimentary verses are identical in metre and style with those of the pagan Arabs 1300 years ago. They have every delicate inflection of the classic language and are undistinguishable except by their subject from the lines of Imrul Qais or Torafa. For this reason, the study of the classic Arabic is the real business of an European who wishes to converse with Muslims or to understand their learning. The language of the oldest times is the language of today without any real change, and it is probable that the invariability will continue. The English learner has nothing to do with local dialects, though even the worst of these is less corrupt than some suppose, since the deviations from rule never affect the written language of the educated. There is one standard Arabic tongue which everywhere prevails, and he who has mastered it will be everywhere understood and honoured, even by those who are unable to imitate his more perfect speech. It is to this ancient and enduring language that I invite your attention. End of a lecture given on December 3rd, 1868 by Thomas Cheenery, Part 2. Recording by Abu Jalal. Recorded 
in Oxford, England.